Menopause is a chapter of every woman's life. Every woman will experience menopause. And when I use the term women, I'm also including trans and non-binary people. In the UK, the average age of a menopausal woman is 51. And by that we mean that's the average age that the woman has not experienced a menstrual period or a menstrual blood loss for at least 12 months. Now, the menopausal symptoms actually start earlier than this for many people. 80% of women experience menopausal symptoms. And these can range in anything from 45 years of age to 55 years of age. And for many women, these can be really debilitating. There's actually over 30 registered menopausal symptoms. Now, a recent study conducted by the Fawcett Society of over 4,000 women aged between 45 to 55 years of age identified that the most common menopausal symptoms that women experienced were sleep, and that was 84% of women said they had trouble with their sleep, 73% said they experienced brain fog problems, 70% hot flushes, 69% affected by anxiety and mental health issues, and 67% joint pain or joint aches. So as you can see, they really range from both mental, physical and emotional uh, symptoms. And for every woman, it's going to be entirely different. No two of us are the same. No two menopause journeys are the same. So it's worth keeping an open mind if you're not feeling yourself that maybe some of those symptoms could be related to the menopause. As part of the Fawcett Society research, they also identified that 44% of women said their ability to work had been affected, and 61% of those said that they had suffered from lack of motivation, 52% had a reduction in confidence, and 26% took time off work. And this is obviously crucial for every workplace, um, so it affects women directly, but all of us indirectly. Now these symptoms can be very severe for many, many women and actually so severe that one in 10 women have left the workplace. 14% have reduced their hours and 8% have not gone for the promotion. So it does affect all of us individually, but as a workplace as well. So if you're looking for tips to help manage menopausal symptoms, perhaps yourself or a colleague, a partner or a friend, as a menopause specialist and also with an MSc in nutritional medicine, I want to share some of the information that I've gathered and some of the experience over the years. The first thing to think about is, can you detail your symptoms? And it's very hard, but try to write it down. In fact, there are many free apps that you can, you can use. Balance is a very good one that also has a report that you can generate and take to your doctor. So in that, you can, you can include your symptoms, what your reproductive cycle is like, trying to see a pattern. And because we've only got 10 minutes with our doctor, so we want to have all the information to hand because it can be very difficult to explain to somebody how you feel when you don't even really know yourself. And I would encourage you to speak to your doctor as well. Because in addition to doing a blood test to see if you are menopausal, and that's called an FSH blood test, follicle stimulating hormone, they should also do blood tests for your iron level because uh, anemia symptoms are very sim similar to menopause. And they should also test your thyroid function to rule those two health issues out because again, they're very, very similar. So have a conversation with your doctor. Perhaps the family planning doctor would be the best person and talk about what options are available to you. So I urge you to have that conversation with your doctor first of all. Now, in terms of dietary and lifestyle advice, there's an awful lot that we can do. So in terms of what dietary things, first of all, let's look at those. So stimulants, okay? By stimulants, I'm thinking caffeine and I'm thinking alcohol, okay? So where you can, try to reduce those. If you, for example, already experience hot flushes, I'm sure you've probably realized or worked out that your hot flushes are worse when you've had more caffeine or you've had more alcohol to drink. And it's overstimulating our adrenal glands and they're already worked, overworked. So by adding extra pressure on them means that they're less able to do their original jobs as well. Our fuse becomes a lot shorter. We snap quicker when we don't mean it. So think about reducing those stimulants and sometimes have some days when you don't have them at all, perhaps. Also think about 
um, in terms of alcohol. Many people think that it is your friend. It does help you relax maybe at the end of the day, but really that is limited to a small amount of alcohol. When we start to have more than one unit, it starts to affect the quality of our sleep, which of course we know is very important during menopause as well. So think about those excessive stimulants. Can you reduce them a little bit? You may also want to think about your diet. So in terms of protein, protein is any animal product, so meat, fish, dairy or eggs, but it also includes the plant sources. Plant sources are all examples of protein, but they're not quite as protein dense as the animal products, but nonetheless they are still very valuable and should be a big part of your diet. There's a lot of research talking about the benefits of a plant-based diet for menopausal and postmenopausal women, and certainly where you can, including variety and breadth of different, and we're not just talking about fruit and vegetables here, I'm talking about all plant sources. So things like nuts and seeds and herbs and spices and lentils and beans, all of those all count, they're all plant sources, and they're all really, really good sources of protein, helping you to keep fuller for longer. Which leads me on to the next point. So brain fog is very common for many women, and we tend to notice that this is far worse when our blood glucose levels are a bit more like a roller coaster. You've got blood glucose highs and lows, that's your energy throughout the day, and it also is experiences brain fog. So where you can, try to cut down on the ultra processed foods. The ultra processed foods have had a lot of the fiber taken out of them and instead they've had chemicals added to them, sugar for example. So where you can, try and eat whole foods that are close to their form in nature. Those are the ones that are more filling, those are the ones that will give you more sustainable energy and less brain fog. Other things to think about, oats for example. Oats are a really good source of fiber, also a very good complex carbohydrate, which means that you've got more sustainable energy as the day progresses. So could you have oats for breakfast in one format? What about a handful of nuts and seeds, maybe as a snack, maybe add them to a smoothie, or could you put them on your breakfast cereal as well, chop them up? What about hummus? Could you have that with some raw carrot or pepper or celery as a dip mid-afternoon? And um, what about soy? Could you include some soy sauces um, into your, your weekly planner? Can you have um, tofu one night? Maybe have some um, so, uh, soy milk? What about soy yogurts? Soy is very beneficial for menopausal women particularly because it has um, phytoestrogens, which are a weak estrogen effect. And what we find that by adding more of these plant sources in means there's less room for the rubbish. So we start to notice that the weight, your weight, starts to improve without you really thinking too much about it. Because if you're full on the good things, there's less room for the rubbish. Another area to think about is omega-3. And we tend to think about omega-3 as oily fish, and that's correct. And that includes things like salmon, mackerel, sardines, herring, anchovies, all of those are all good, once or twice a week if you can. But if you don't like fish or you're vegetarian or vegan, then you can also try an algal oil, which you can buy from health food stores now. But just a word of caution, if you're on any medication, you should always check with your doctor first before you take any supplements. But algal oil or eating oily fish or taking a fish oil is a great source of omega-3. And why do we encourage menopausal women to take omega-3? Well, it's not just for menopausal women, it's actually good for all of us. So omega-3 is one of our best natural anti-inflammatories. It means that our joints ache less, so if you've got aching knees or hips, you may find that if you consume a bit more omega-3, those the aches tend to reduce. It's also important for our cholesterol because omega-3 improves your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. What about your, your skin, your hair, your nails also improves and also really lots of brilliant research, scientific research in terms of the benefit of omega-3 on mental health. So as you can see, there's a lot of positives, but you do have to stick with omega-3. It's not an overnight miracle. It will take probably two to three months to see any benefit. So don't give up hope on it. Please try and include it more in your diet where you can. So in addition to the dietary aspect, 
other things to think about is exercise. Now there's some interesting research that says actually at this stage of a woman's life, on this chapter, it's actually more important to do frequent amount of exercise but a shorter duration. So if you can, try and avoid saving up the exercise for the weekends. Just do shorter bursts of it every day where you can. Just being active, you know, even if it's the housework, even if it's in the garden, even if it's a brisk walk to the end of your road, do something which elevates your heart rate and you feel slightly out of breath. And doing this regularly is far more beneficial for our joints in menopause, but also our heart. Remember your heart is just a muscle. So if we don't use it, it isn't as efficient and it needs to be strong to pump the blood around our body. Unfortunately, when women get to menopausal stage of life, the risk of cardiovascular disease equals that of men. Before menopause, their risk for women was a lot lower. So we really do need to think about our heart health and think about how we can keep active um, in terms of using that heart muscle and also helping to help us keep a healthy weight. But also it's very important for our bone health. So in addition to keep maybe walking, doing something simple like gardening or, or household chores, what about also doing some weight bearing exercise because that's important for your bones to reduce your risk of osteoporosis. But it's also very important for muscle mass because if we don't use our muscles then they just fatigue and they don't they're not as bulky or as strong and it means that when we're not using them we're not burning as many calories so it's more difficult to keep a healthy weight so by doing some weight bearing exercise can also be really good so things like squats and things like press ups those using those big muscle groups can be really beneficial as well and I also want to mention HRT, so it's not just dietary and lifestyle options. For many women, HRT is also an option. So have that conversation with your doctor about that. For many women, um, they may think that maybe HRT isn't for them. Perhaps there is a family history of breast cancer or blood clots. But the 2002 Women's Health Initiative study that many of us think about was actually 20 years ago now and a lot has changed. The, the, um, the medicine that they used in the trial was a tablet form which is very different to a lot of the HRT that's available now um, and also now we tend not to um, uh, encourage women to take HRT if they've been menopausal for more than 10 years because the risk is greater. So there are a lot of benefits to HRT, but it is unique to you because no two women will have the same menopause journey. So what worked perhaps for your mother, for your aunt, for your sister, for your friend will be completely different from you. You have your own risk profile and that's something you need to have a chat with your doctor about. But maybe also worth mentioning that many women also experience problems with urinary tract infections and discomfort um, in terms of libido and sex drive and intimate relationships. So if that is the case, you can also get um, a topical, which means you apply it to that area, a cream from your pharmacy, which is a type of HRT, but it's not what we call systemic. It means it's not around all of your body. It's just local to that area. And many women really, really feel the benefit of that. So in terms of the workplace, because for many women at this stage of life, in their 40s and their 50s, and in fact 1% of the population will go into what we call premature uh, menopause. So that's before the age of 40. So we do need to keep an open mind in the workplace that also it could be any female can be experiencing this. And we need to keep these women in the workplace. These are valuable contributors. These are women who have spent their entire life towards their career. And what can appear to be overnight, their confidence is knocked, their self-esteem, and they feel the only choice they have is to reduce their hours or leave the workplace. And just for a short chapter of their life is a real travesty. So let's support women in the workplace. And how can we do that? Well, let's normalize the conversation. Let's make it open. Let's stop this taboo. Let's, every woman is going to experience it. So let's talk about it. But we've got to remember that not every woman is going to want to talk about her own experience. So we need to also make sure that we signpost clearly. Where can women go for further help? Is it the HR department? Is it occupational health? Is it private health care or their doctor? Finding different routes that women can go and making it obvious so that they don't need to ask you for that help. They can find it themselves. But the most important thing we can all do is listen. Because as I said at the start, for many women, we don't understand what is going on ourselves. So it's really difficult to explain it to people. 
So give women the chance, ask them how they're feeling, ask them what can be done to help because no two people are the same. And encouraging them to talk, provide a um, menopause champion or a support network group can also be hugely beneficial because women can share their symptoms and share what they find works for them and help support each other. Let's try and keep women in the workplace for as long as they want to be there. Because it is just a chapter of a woman's life and she shouldn't need to give up her career if she doesn't want to. And she certainly is not alone and should always know that there is support available to her. So let's make the conversation more open. Let's talk about it and let's stop this taboo.